my wife and I were at the Office Depot Aldi on 441 and Oakland Park Boulevard on the, that corner. And I was coming out of one of the stores. I think she was in Aldi and I was in Office Depot. And I came out and this lady stepped out from behind a column in the shopping center there and handed me something and then took off. Like handed me, it was a gospel tract. And I just want to tell you something. Nothing has probably ever touched my heart that somebody has done as much as the fact that that lady gave me a gospel tract. It's the only first time in my life anybody's ever tried to share the gospel with me. Now I'm saved. And I, could, I tried to find her afterward. I think she thought I wanted to argue with her or something, you know. And I just want to thank her. Say, man, thank you. Thanks for caring about people enough to give me a gospel tract. And uh, that made a real impression on me. And I just remember this. And I, my thought on it was, if I didn't have Christian parents who preached the gospel to me, this would be the only chance that I've had in my whole life to keep from going to hell. And it just really touched my heart. You know, I just thought, man, this is really important that we do this sort of thing. And uh, so, I don't know what your inhibitions are. I understand, you know, some people think, well, you know, nobody likes you going by their houses and so forth. There may be someone who appreciates the fact that you're trying to stand between hell and them. And that literally is what we're doing when we share the gospel. And so we ought to do it deliberately. We ought to understand that there are people that don't want you to hand them things people that don't want you to knock on doors. But every time I have somebody tell me, no one wants you to do this, I also have someone else tell me, everyone wants this. Everyone needs this. And that's been our experience. So please come. I, I couldn't put in a plug for anything more important than our church-wide soul winning on Tuesday evening at 6.30. Okay? Uh, that isn't to say that's the only time that we could go. If, if Tuesday doesn't work for you, we also uh, have folks that go out every Saturday and regularly, a lot of what they do is follow up on kids. But we could really use a group or a team that will go out on Saturday mornings and try to encounter new kids and uh, get more folks to come as well. That would you could work with that just fine if if Saturdays are a better day for you than Tuesday nights. The reason we pick 6:30 is it seems to be that happy medium between when people are having dinner and when they first gotten home, and uh, and so forth. Seems like a lot of people eat around seven. And so it worked really well this last Tuesday evening, and we look forward to it as well. All right, don't forget about Easter Sunday coming up on April the 16th. Lord willing, we're going to try to have some flyers for that that you could give out. And uh, we have actually probably need to get that. Could you design something for me to have printed for next Tuesday's soul winning? That'd be great to pass out when we're soul winning as well to do some uh, Easter Sunday flyers. Folks are going to go somewhere for the one of the only times that year. And it'd be great if they came to a place where they will hear the gospel preached. So let's, uh, let's pray about these things. Let's bathe these things in prayer. Let's commit ourselves to them and ask God to do things that are beyond what we could ask for and what we could ourselves be responsible for. Uh, that's, uh, that's all we have time to announce this morning. And so Go with me across that raises me.
Romans chapter 12, while they dismiss, is our text today. Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. We'll read the first two verses, and then we will begin in verse 9, and we'll actually, uh, we'll actually read all the way to the end of the chapter, but our text today is going to be in verses 9 through 13. We're going to have to divide our text, or we'll spend too much time in our message today. I know you wish I divided our text last week, but I just couldn't do it. And so, Romans chapter 12 and verse the first two verses, then down to verse 9, and uh, then I'll have some, we'll pray and have some opening questions. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not I things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to man, to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of men. If it be all possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but Rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And the text does not end here. The context does not end here. But this is where we will stop and we'll pray and to begin our message this morning. Father, we pray that you would help us with hearts that are malleable, willing, and with minds that are sharp, and, Father, that have great comprehension to understand and apply your word, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. What is it? What does it mean? What is a living sacrifice? It's different than the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Is that what you said? Okay. Um, maybe. Okay. Uh, well, we can define the word sacrifice, right? What sacrifice? What is it when something is sacrificed, though? What happens to it? It dies. it dies, right? So really, if you examine the statement or the two words put together, they are an oxymoron in a sense, aren't they? Sure. Living dead. Makes for a great horror movie, I suppose. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that it's actually a construction that's designed to make us say, what? What does that mean? How does that make sense? Because that literally is the construction. We're supposed to present ourselves as living dead. Okay? And I think that sometimes we don't examine that enough to ask for the application. Now, I said a couple of weeks ago I wasn't going to preach the first several verses. First of all, Brother Tim Thompson preached 
this passage of Scripture very well uh, just a couple of weeks ago. But secondly, I think everyone here has probably memorized Romans 12, 1 through 3, or at least is familiar with it that you've probably heard a lot of messages on presenting your body as a living sacrifice. And always, 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 when I've heard those messages preached, it seems as though to me the context is sacrificing yourself. In other words, the word living is less emphasized as the fact that we're to sacrifice ourselves. And I don't know if you're one of those people that see cartoons in your mind like uh, I am. You know, I see, live, I see myself being presented as a living sacrifice. And so I, you know, I see this bleeding image of myself on an altar, uh, but, I, but I never die or something, you know, like that. Uh, but, you know, it really, you ought to question. You ought to ask questions. Well, what does God mean? When he says that, do you think, which, could we agree this morning, that if God used two words that seemed to contradict each other together, that it was for the purpose of making us ask the question, what does this mean? Sure, yes. It is. You ought to be that kind of a thinker as a Christian. When you see something in the Scripture and you think, that doesn't make sense, you ought to think enough to stop and say, well then, what is God saying? Because oftentimes that's a construction or that is the way that the Holy Spirit uses to get you to say, what is He saying? And that wakes you back up. Sometimes you just kind of reading through the Scripture, you're listening to truth, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. What did I just say? Uh, you know, but this is one of those that say, what? What did you say? That's the kind of a statement it is. Okay, so we have just finished, really, uh, tying up what God is going to do with Israel in the future, what God is doing currently with the church in the present. And one of the things now that is happening is that the Holy Spirit is using the Apostle Paul to help the church in Rome to understand how to subsist profitably or practically. You like that word? If you're in Sunday school, you know what the word exist means. Uh, but how to... Uh, how to be part of the same body, part of the same church, and accomplish the Lord's work. And so if you look at it in terms of context, if you see the word therefore and you recognize, okay, we have just looked at this statement or this phrase, the Jews and the Greeks, and we understand the natural friction between those two, uh, those two groups inside the body, we don't see Paul's practical suggestion. You know what we should really do? We should put the Jews in a church over here, and we should put the Gentiles in a church over here. That way, based on their differences, they can unite through separation. Isn't that what we usually think a lot of times? They're just so different that, you know, uh, they can't subsist alongside one another. They have to be separated. I know the word exists, exists, but the word exists. Every time I hear Brother Taj say exists now, I just, my mind substitutes the other word for it, so it's it's uh, fun for me. It's a new word. I probably lose the original, but that's what happens when you you know have generational developments. So stay woke, bro. All right. Anyway, <laughs> um, the point I'm trying to make is this: Paul's solution was not for the Jews to separate from the Gentiles. The point was to teach them how to carry on the work of the body together. Wouldn't it be good if we thought that way? Wouldn't it be good for the church if instead of separating over differences of background, personality, and mindset, that we unified because of the authority and the truth of the Scripture? That's God's plan. That's God's way. Okay, so last week we looked at Okay, so let me answer the question. The question is, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Well, interestingly enough, the Scripture doesn't say be a living sacrifice and leave it there. That's exactly what the rest of Romans is about. Being a living sacrifice. And so if you're outlining Romans and you're separating out the different parts of Romans, you could do it sort of this way. Your outline could look like this. You'd have the introduction, the first part of Romans, where Paul greets the church at Rome and in the introduction, he states his purpose. He states his purpose. He says, I want to come see you that I could depart or so could impart some spiritual gift. And so he does talk a lot about spiritual gifts. It actually, is one of the topics that he begins Romans 1 with. And then he explains the 
real purpose and his real purpose in the introduction is to get the Jews and the Greeks to work together. That's why he says, "For the I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. So using the introduction of Jews and Greeks as a theme for Romans, and then taking for his outline the first point being salvation, Paul develops the doctrine of salvation for the first portion of the book. He first begins with accountability for salvation. Jews are accountable to be saved, Greeks are accountable to be saved, and gives the reason why. Then he develops the simplicity of salvation, develops the law of faith. And so he explains that salvation is by faith. And then he defends salvation by explaining that salvation is not by the works of the flesh, it's by faith. And then he illustrates salvation by using the illustration of Abraham who was saved before the law. And then, following that, Paul sort of has had a portion of the, of the material where he is taking Jews and Greeks and the differences between the two and really dealing with the fact that God today is using the church. And the Jews fit in the church, and the Greeks fit in the church, and then he deals with the fact that God is not done with Israel. All Israel is going to be saved. So, again, the same theme is all the way woven through. We're all saved the same way. We're saved by faith, whether we're Jews or Greeks. We see God's theme, and again, it just comes up over and over and over again. The Jew first, also to the Greek. Then we saw God's future plan for Israel, and now we're told, okay, based on everything you learn, this is how to be a living sacrifice. This is how to live. After he said everything, now he is beginning the concluding or the the application element of the book. And so, you know, it's really interesting to me that oftentimes if you're going to ask people about portions of Romans, what's in Romans? They'll a lot of times, you know, some people will know Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A lot of people, you know, that have shared the gospel know Romans 3, Romans 5, Romans 10, right? So the verses at least that they've uh, put together to help share the gospel. But the question, if you ask what's in Romans, is, I think, seldom if never answered in giving you the actual practical application for the entire book, which begins in Romans chapter 12. In other words, how to live what you've learned. Or so you have all this information, 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 and hasn't it been a help? And by the way, wasn't Romans chapter 6 really practical? Uh, dead to the flesh alive unto God. Isn't that wasn't really practical? Bat, the fact that we are baptized into Christ's death, isn't that a truth that you can live? Yes, it is. Okay, so I'm not saying there's been no application up to this point. The fact is, is that we can apply, apply, apply all the facts. But this is Paul's application. This is the Holy Spirit's application. This is how you live what you've learned. And the way you live what you've learned is through being a living sacrifice. And so we take the two truths, the fact that we are supposed to be living and the fact that we're supposed to be dead. And doesn't that fit well with the theme of Romans? So, let's be fun with it. We are the living dead, if you will, as believers. In other words, this is how to be the living dead. Last week, then, the first thing that we're told about how to practically live a sacrifice is to understand spiritual gifts. To understand spiritual gifts. And there was one nugget that, that I'm not going to go over last week's message. You need to listen to it. It's too long for me to summarize this week. But there's one nugget that we really ought to take away, and I sort of pointed out in, by way of application with the Jews and the Greeks concept a bit ago, and that is that it is a tendency in the church for individuals to assemble or congregate on the similarity of spiritual gifts versus the difference of spiritual gifts. And that's exactly the opposite of what God wants. In other words, churches usually have a distinctive, distinctive personality because of a lack of diversity in spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. If a church is really, really good at program-centered type of things, then people that are program-centered will tend to go to that church. And so you have a lot of people that are all looking for the same thing. But actually, a spiritual gift is something that you bring to the church, and if people are different than you, uh, then, then that's, a, that's the most practical place for you to exercise your spiritual gift. So a lot of times, we tend to look for a church where people all, you know, well, that church does a lot of soul winning. I need to go there. Well, actually, you probably, if, you, if, if uh, 
if soul winning is one of the things that you need and you have a spiritual gift that would help me. By the way, soul winning is practically applied through all the spiritual gifts. But don't you think if the church didn't have something and that was your gift, you know that church just really doesn't have much of a charitable outreach program. Well, don't look for a church that has one. Exercise your spiritual gift in the one that doesn't have one. You understand the point of it? In other words, a church is supposed to be diversified. A church is supposed to be... I've I, I got to be careful with... You can't pull these terms out of the context of Romans. But a church is supposed to be balanced with, with regard to spiritual gifts. And if we're going to be balanced with spiritual gifts, then, as the Scripture says, having all gifts differing from one another, then we're going to be very different from one another, and that's what's going to make the thing effective. We're going to be a balanced ministry because of our differences in gifts, which helps us to be unified. And again, the point is Jews are different than Greeks. Background's different. The way they think is different and so forth. But the gospel's the same. And so let's come together. Let's, uh, let's make this thing work God's way. And the way to make that thing work is first by being a living sacrifice. Secondly, by exercising our spiritual gifts. And today we're going to look at behaviors. How a Christian should behave. And I'll just be honest with you. I think a lot of Christians don't know how to act. Uh, I used to have an aunt who assumed that uh, my parents uh, didn't teach us anything at home. And so whenever my aunt would, would uh, babysit us, she would say, now in this house, we have manners. And we're going to mind our manners. And I understand her perspective. Here's the deal. We were on lockdown around my parents. And that's really the truth. I mean... People used to say when we would go into China stores and things like that with my mom, I just can't believe it. We were really little. My sister would have been like five. I would have been, you know, three or four. My brother would have been like two, a toddler. And we literally wouldn't touch anything, wouldn't mess around, just be there very, very silently. The reason for this, my mom would have killed us if we'd done anything. And so I remember, you know, one lady when we were a kid remarking about our behavior. I have tortured memories of... <laughs> The equivalent of Joanne Fabrics and uh, the pattern sections in Kmart and Walmart. My mom was a sewing lady, and she used to torture us as children and take us. Uh, while, you know how they, they used to have the file cabinets, things full of patterns, yeah. with the, the little desk thing that you sit up on a stool? How well can kids see what's going on up there from on the floor, from on the ground? No, okay. How interesting are the front of file cabinets to children? Okay, so we would stand there, I mean, probably days, but it, it seemed like at least hours to us. Well, my mom would go through patterns, and we kids would have nothing to do, but, you know, you, you behaved yourself. Okay, so when we got away from our parents, somebody babysat us, we were like, you know, lions out of their cages. You know, it's like, ah, you know, mom can't whip me right now. <laughs> and she can't, she's not coming back for like 12 hours. So, you know, but my aunt used to sit down and say, we are going to teach, you know, in our house, we have manners. And it was just different because the manners that my cousins were allowed versus the manners that my uh, parents allowed would have been different. In other words, they'd be allowed to just go out and go places without permission from their parents. We didn't do anything without permission and so forth. So it was just, just a difference. But uh, this, if you will, is the portion of the Scripture where the Bible teaches us how to act, how to behave. And it is important to know how to behave, isn't it? Does it bother you when people don't have just what you think should be appropriate manners? They just don't, they don't know appropriate manners. I think as a Christian, etiquette is a good idea. And I'm just, I'm just talking about generally etiquette, not, nothing spiritual. Most of the problem in the church, honestly, is two-prong, and we're going to look at the second prong of the problems of the church. Most of the church's problems come from not having a common authority. In other words, people don't know how to divide the Word of God. And because they don't, they, the Bible doesn't have the right amount of authority in their life, then they interpret what the Word of God says, so they disagree because of interpretation. Would you agree with that? There's a lot of Christians disagree about how to live, how to act, how to think, what God says, on the basis of what they think they have permission to do with the Word of God, which is to privately interpret it. That's one of the major areas. But the second area, and I think this, this would be an area that for folks that are like-minded in our church or have the mindset that this church generally has, the second area where folks would have trouble with each other would be how to behave toward each other, how to act toward each other, or how to act toward believers at large. And this first portion of the Scripture really deals with how Christians 
ought to act toward each other. This is literally God's etiquette book. Um, can you see some scenarios unfolding in your mind? Can you imagine a disgusting Gentile doing things that would offend a very kosher Jew in the church? Can you imagine just habits and things that he would do? And can you imagine how offensive the Jew might be to the disgusting Gentile? And how offended the uh, kosher Jew might be just because of not knowing how to act toward each other? In other words, don't things offend you that are oftentimes differences in people and behaviors? Okay, let me give you, for instance, chewing with your mouth open and smacking. I can't stand it. I just, I don't, there, there are some of you, I eat with you, and I, it just drives me nuts. <laughs> it's just, it's offensive to me. You know, um, I've heard, I don't, no one has ever given the, given the actual facts, so I think this could be like a made-up fact, but I've heard uh, that there are cultures where it's a compliment to the chef to smack loudly when you eat. So, I've heard that. Now, you, could, you know, I'm sure people can make up, you know, some tribe somewhere, you know, <laughs> wherever it is, someplace that I couldn't visit very easily and, and find out whether the facts are actually substantiated. But that bothers me. Does it bother you? Yes. Some of you it doesn't. Don't say yes if it doesn't. If, if you don't, you know, you've got to be truthful about this. That bothers me about some of you too. So, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I'm just trying to be funny. Don't anybody get offended over this. Okay, so now the Bible says how we're supposed to act toward each other. Let's go through the list and we'll be done this morning. Begin at verse 9, after we've looked at the spiritual gift of ruling and showing mercy. Verse 9, the Bible says, Let love be without dissimulation. Now for you folks that would think that it's unfortunate that the King James translators use such long words, let me just, just say something to you that I hope will be a help. They used words if, in, that, if you don't understand, have more meaning than the word you think they should have used. In other words, to use a different word, like unfeigned, would be to lose some of the gist of dissimulation. So it would be better for you to learn dissimulation than it would be to just substitute a different word. But a word that you could help to explain dissimulation with would be the word um, would be uh, the word unfeigned. And by the way, unfeigned is a little bit archaic in some people's minds too, right? So, uh, not fake, uh, real, genuine, and without any kind of a pretense or a pretend kindness or motive, actually just be real genuine love. This would be where if Goo were preaching today, he would bring up Brother Tosh in this for an illustration. Or uh, Tony would bring up Taj. So last week, Taj told Tony, he said, I love you, brother, and Tony said, I doubt it. <laughs> in other words, what Tony was implying is that there was dissimulation in brother Taj's love toward him. Okay, that's the best illustration that I can use. It's a near one, and uh, both people referenced are here. And so you can't love people like that, mister. Right. So, let love be without dissimulation. In other words, don't fake love. Now, it doesn't say, you know, don't act like you love someone if you don't. It says, love them and don't act like, uh, you know, don't act like you love them, actually do it. How would that be, you know, how would that be practically applied? I hear this all the time. Anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> You, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. And based on the person who says it, it has different meaning. Right? Some people, it's just, it's just dissimulation. It's just, yes, I'm offering to do something for you, but practically speaking, if you actually needed me, I'd have a reason why I couldn't help you. That's what it means. Brotherly love means what it says. It's not pre there's no pretense to it. There's no feigned or fakeness to it. It's literally a let love be without dissimulation. How do you be a living sacrifice? Well, real love. Real love. Do you think that there would be sacrifice in unfeigned love? Do you think there could be a lot, couldn't there? Financial? Physical? Both. Wouldn't it be so? Okay, so how do I act like a living sacrifice? Well, you know, you'd think God wants us to make great promises. 
or do great things, right? Don't we always, you know, we preach Romans chapter 12 and everybody surrenders. They put themselves on the altar. Here's the altar. It's a platform or steps in most churches. They want you to come down to the old-fashioned altar, they say. It's not an altar. An altar is a place of sacrifice. So everybody comes down, they put themselves on an altar, and symbolically when they leave, they're at the altar. In other words, I surrendered. I'm at the altar. I'm sacrificed. In other words, I'm dead. But God's Word says that if you're a living sacrifice, then your love will be without dissimulation. That's how you live out sacrifice. And that's a, that's a possibility, isn't it? That's a possibility for it to be living and sacrifice. Because I'm setting myself aside and I am investing myself, the things that would have been for me, I'm investing for my brother, Love without dissimulation means something. It means something. It's not words. It's real. Verse 8 or verse 9. There's a second word. Uh, the word cleave. Now, a lot of people have lost the meaning of the word cleave. And again, it's a good, it's a good word. But the idea is to grip or to glue. To grip like glue. The best illustration would be for men or ladies who have used contact cement. You ever, you ever used contact cement before? Uh, you ever, if you put contact cement on something that contact cement adheres to, which is a lot of things actually, plastic, formica, if you have formica countertops, they're held to the particle board or wood with contact cement. If you put contact cement on something, there's a process. The first thing you do is you put cement on this side, and then you put some on this side and you let it get a little tacky and you stick it together. And I'll just tell you something. If you stick it together and it's not aligned, too late. It's glued. I mean, it's just... Uh, grab that door, open that up for, for Randy. Okay, so if, if you put contact cement on something, if you put contact on cement on one side, you can usually pull it apart. So the idea of cleave is the idea of grip or glue, but it's to hold together. So the word cleave is to hold together. And I, again, for me, you know, I think of, in terms of building and making things a lot of times. And for me, contact cement's the best thing. Because you put contact cement on this side, and you put contact cement on this side, and if they touch, wherever they touch, they're together. That's why a man is supposed to leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. It's a He's holding, she's holding, and they're one. That's a great word for unity, isn't it? See, the first manner in the church is love without dissimulation. The second manner in the church is to cleave to that which is good. What a great idea. That is, get a hold of a concept, get a hold of something that's from God's Word, and it's good. You can take the word good, and this isn't the this isn't the scope of the word. This isn't the final scope of the word, but you could just do a word study on what God calls good in the Word of God. You could just do a word study on good, and those would be practical things that you're supposed to glue to, and they're supposed to be glued to you. This is a word that emphasizes no compromise. In other words, if it's good, don't let go of it. Well, you know, sometimes as believers, we, we have the good, the better, and the best, right, ideas. And sometimes good gets trumped by better or best. Or sometimes good gets trumped by, well, yeah, that would be good. What do we say after that would be good? But... In other words, yeah, it's good, but, you know, in other words, we, we rate it in importance. The Bible says if it's good, hold on to it. Hold on to it. Wouldn't it be great if Christians were unbending and cleaving to good? Yeah. Say, I don't know. I don't like unbending people. Well, that's what you're supposed to be, my friend, when it comes to good. What God calls good, you're supposed to cleave to it. We're supposed to be unbending, uncompromising. Wouldn't that be a great testimony for the church? Good. Cleaving that which is good. Okay, uh, verse 10. The Bible says, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. If you look at the words in the language here, 
The word kindly and affection carry with them the same idea as brotherly love. It's just a longer uh, unified construction. It's the word Philadelphia or the word philos or love for a brother. So brotherly love. And the word kindly affectioned and brotherly love kind of are almost a saying the same thing a second time. In other words, the point here is a lot of emphasis. In other words, we're supposed to like each other and be kindly affectioned toward each other. Isn't it interesting how the thing you can't stand is endearing in some people and just... I mean, it's, it's the, the straw that broke the camel's back for somebody that you don't like. Right? You ever met somebody you didn't like and they had a behavior on top of it? No, I mean, you don't like some people. Don't, don't be this, you know, oh, I, you know, I'm without dissimulation. I love everybody. You know, like Brother Arnie at White Lake Baptist Church. Brother Arnie loves everybody. Brother Arnie doesn't hate anybody. Brother Arnie does. Everybody knows Brother Arnie loves, you know, anyway. Uh... The fact is, is some, there's some people that get on your nerves. And what really gets on your nerves are some things they do. And the idea of being kindly affectioned is kind of what it's like when you admire, respect, and really like a person and how forgiving you are about things that are not perfect about them. While at the same time, somebody else did the same thing. Um, some years ago, I can't remember what it was exactly, but I remember with teenagers. In teasing, I did something to somebody. I don't know what it was. I didn't flick them, but I did something to them. I, something to a teenager. I don't know what it was. I did some kind of a prank to them. And another teenager did the same thing to them. And it ended up in a fight. When I did it, it was funny. They laughed. So the other teenagers said, oh, that's funny. So he tried it. And guess what? Well, why was that? Well, it's, you know, hey, pastor did it. It's funny. You know, but the very same behavior from somebody else is like, you don't have the right to do that. You can't treat me like that. You can't whatever, whatever, whatever. And there was a difference in the person who did it. And the reason is because they weren't kindly affectionate toward one another with brotherly love. The truth of the matter is my brother can get away with a lot. He can get away with a whole lot that other people couldn't. The reason? He's my brother. There's nothing my brother could do where I still wouldn't like him. And it isn't just because he's so likable. It's because he's my brother. That's what it really comes down to. I know growing up, you know, it seems like brothers fight a lot. and You know, they get mad at each other faster than they do anyone else. But I think when you grow, and when you grow up, you, you just really get a bond with people that are, that are your family. And that's the way we're supposed to be in the church. It really ought to be that if it's just a behavior or a mannerism or something that personally annoys you about everybody, that if it's a brother or sister in the church, that it doesn't bother you at all. You know who the person is that annoys the most people in the average church? The guy that speaks the most. He's bound to say something annoying. Isn't it true? Yeah. So, you're supposed to be kindly affectionate one toward another. In other words... If you love them like a brother, then, yeah, I love it when he does that. I really have a good way to take it. The Bible says, abhor that which was evil. This, this seems like it would be well done in, in the construction with, um, I'm sorry, I, I, missed, I missed abhor that which is evil in the cleave that which is good. And it is, the, it is in the construction that would complement the good. So, hate what's evil glue to that which is good. Now, the Bible says the second part of be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, the second part of that is in honor preferring one another. In honor preferring one another. If we're together as a body, and a good way to illustrate this is men's retreat. You know, it's really, you ought to go on men's retreat. If you're a man, if you're a lady, you ought to just go watch. But, uh, you ought to go sometime on men's retreat because it's really fun to watch like 10 to 15 of us all flying on an airplane. You know, and just look at the horror on the faces of other people and realize they're all together. You know, uh, but it's really funny when we get off the airplane, we race through the airport and we go and get rental cars to watch people go for the best seats in the rental cars. You know, if you're in a seven-passenger minivan, the best two seats are 
are the driver's seat and the middle seat in the front. The middle front seat where you can put your legs up between the deal, between the two seats. Okay, so the real question is, who should have those seats? Well, we have a thing called insurance for our church, which usually designates the person in the driver's seat and disqualifies some other people from being there. So we have liability factor that gives that seat, you know, oh, we need to have this person drive because they have a perfect driving record, whatever, 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 uh, or they're the right age, you know. So that, that one's designated. But really the next two best seats would be the front middle seat, or the, you know, the first seat in the middle if you're in a minivan, and then the front right seat because there's leg room, right? Okay. Brother Al goes to Beacon Baptist Church in Jupiter now. But uh, I have seen him crawl all the way to the back seat too many times in our church vans. Because he's usually the oldest guy on our trip, and he's also the tallest. And it makes absolutely no sense at all for other people to take a better seat than Brother Al gets. Because he's a senior member, and, uh, and I don't mean senior as in you know terms of membership, I mean he's the oldest guy on the trip, and he has the longest legs. So who ought to have the best seat in the van? It just makes sense, doesn't it? But it's amazing to me that sometimes you have to tell people, give Al the seat, man. What are you doing sitting in that seat when Brother Al is long? Okay, so who else should have a, have a seat? Well, I think people with disabilities or inabilities, right, should have a, a better seat than someone else, don't you? Charlie. Yeah. That was funny. I know. I didn't want to laugh for it. We said disability, inability, and Frank's like, Charlie, that was me. <laughs> wow, an honor preferring one another. Yeah. Okay. Charlie's like, now let Frank have it. <laughs> okay. So my point is this, folks. In other words, it shouldn't be, no, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. But everybody ought to have the attitude that somebody is more deserving than themselves. That's what in honor preferring one another means. You have to teach children that, don't you? Yeah. You got to teach kids, you know, not to take the best for themselves. You know, you get on the bus on a teen trip, and you have a kid that just wants the best seat. He knows what the best seat is. He's going to take it. I take it away from him sometimes. Why? Well, because you want them to prefer one another. That's the doctrine that you're teaching. You're not teaching the person, you know, rights. You're teaching no rights. In other words, if I love people, I'm in honor going to prefer one another. Now, that's a silly seat illustration, but it's really funny how it shakes out in all kinds of different things. In other words, what's best for them is best for me, is the mindset of one who in honor prefers one another. Moving forward. In honor preferring one another, then the Bible says uh, in verse 11, not slothful in business. Now, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Here we are talking about how to act, and then the Bible says not slothful in business. Well, this is a stewardship principle for a person who's a living sacrifice. This is a stewardship for a person who's a living sacrifice. The fact of the matter is I'm continually under conviction for the realization that I could be more effective than I am. And I think everybody ought to, you know, I, that song, I wonder have I done my best for Jesus? I feel like it's an altar call every time I sing it. Isn't it for you? I wonder it. No, I haven't. But the idea is diligent in business. In other words, using your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a dead, a living dead Christian, you'll be diligent in business. In other words, I can't waste my time. It's the Lord's. I sacrificed it to God. I'm dead to the flesh. I'm alive to the Spirit. Diligent in business. It's important, isn't it? How often do we think about living sacrifice in terms of diligent in business? I would dare to say not so often. Fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit. Fervent is a great word, actually, to describe um, boiling. Did you guys see the news in, from Yellowstone? It's really sad. Uh, uh, couple of months ago, and I was actually there right before it happened in, in the Yellowstone. How many of you have been to the uh, Yellowstone, to the geysers? What do they call that? Charlie has, Joel has. You should go there and look at it sometime. Angela has. So a few of you guys have. Isn't it amazing how hot the water is coming out of the ground, how cool that is? Well, there are some people that have really the same idea that I think everyone thinks when they go by it is, what a great hot tub. 
you know, when they see the boiling water. And there was, there was a couple of guys that decided they were going to take a mineral bath, a hot mineral bath. They stepped off the trail and they went into the water and they were dissolved. And they, they found sandals, some like Crocs style sandals floated up. And that's all, I mean, literally, I think it was a girl and her brother. It was this last fall. I think that was, it was a girl and her brother. And the brother decided, you know, I'm going to, we're going to take a hot spring bath. And he stepped in and just gone. And that fervent water got him. Now, there's minerals in it that dissolve people. But the main thing that got him was it, it's just, you know, it's 900 degrees, uh, you know, at the points that they can measure right there. You know, when it flows down a little ways, it's cooler. But it's really hot. And the idea of fervent is like boiling water. I look at y'all. I woke everybody up. Everybody's like, oh. That's terrible. Why? Uh, yeah, fervent. Fervent. The idea of fervent is what the water's like when it's literally boiling. And that's the way we're supposed to be spiritually or in our spirit. Fervent in spirit. Uh, we have a term for it, on fire. On fire. How fervent are you about your faith? How on fire are you about the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, how affected are you by spiritual things? You're literally supposed to be just boiling over. You ever meet a person who's really, really, really had God do something amazing? Usually your salvation and then answered prayer. Or maybe God is just, man, God's speaking to me. His Spirit's been moving me. And they're just boiling over. It's like, you know, cool it, bud. Fervent. Don't cool it. That's the idea. Living sacrifice is fervent in spirit. That's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's practical. It's helpful. Uh, the Bible goes on to say serving the Lord. You know, being fervent in spirit makes a second one a related concept. You see the relations in each of these concepts? Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Abhor that which is evil, uh, cleave to that which is good. Okay? Now, verse 12, rejoicing in hope. Every Christian ought to understand that hope is not possibility. It's not a term of possibility. It's a term of expectation. When you know something's going to happen, you hope for it. I mean, for instance, you know I'm going to finish the message this morning sometime. <laughs> yeah, it's not a possible. I mean, you know, a pastor can only go so long, right? Ted Cruz made how long on his uh, filibuster when he read uh, when he read uh, Green Eggs and Ham and so forth a couple of years ago. Remember this? He stood on the floor of the Senate and held as long as he could. And I think he made it like 22 hours. So... You know, you could hope for pastor to quit preaching and realize that probably humanly speaking, he could probably only go about a day more than Ted Cruz, most likely. <laughs> you know, so there's, it isn't a matter of, of if it'll happen, it's a matter of when it'll happen and you're looking forward to it. And that's the part that applies to you right now. Okay? Rejoicing in hope. In other words, it isn't about what, the way things are, it's about the way the things are going to be. Right? Uh, we were talking about this morning before Sunday school, what a great day this is. And the fact that because of Jesus being alive and risen from the dead, the very worst thing for most people is not bad at all for a believer. In other words, the worst case scenario for most people, and that is people that don't know Jesus, is death, right? Isn't it true? How bad of a scenario is that for any of us? It's not even bad. It isn't even bad. In other words, I was joking this morning, it would be worse for me if Taj were to ignore me than if I were to die. Because death is not a problem, but you know, my feelings might get hurt if Taj ignores me. Right? Get it? Okay. That's the idea of about uh, that we are supposed to be hope, the Bible says, hope, or rejoicing in hope. So, how pessimistic is a living sacrifice? Are things going to end up all right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, a Christian says, man, I'm glad things are going to end up right. Even when it looks like there's no hope, because there is hope and we rejoice in it. Isn't that great? Living sacrifice rejoices in hope. A pessimistic Christian is a Christian who is not a living sacrifice, rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Patient in tribulation, the word patient is best understood by wait. Wait. Waiting. Waiting. It's amazing how hardship forces many individuals, I shouldn't say forces, but affects many individuals to make rash choices. People do rash things in hard times. 
It's one of the causes for debt. It's one of the causes for uh, bad relationships. People just don't, they're just not willing to wait. They just won't wait for things to be right. But if it's right, if it's God's way, then we're patient in tribulation. The Bible says continuing instant in prayer. Continuing instant in prayer. This is a complementary portion of the Scripture to when Timothy, what Paul tells Timothy, I would that many men of God should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In other words, the idea is you just always, the first thing you think of is let's pray. Let's ask God. How many times in a week do you have scenarios where you don't know or you cannot? What are you going to do? Let's pray. That's the idea. Um, what, what, how are you going to act? I better pray. In other words, God can do it. I can't. So, continuing instant in prayer. And then our last verse today. Distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. This is Christian socialism practically carried out. Justly carried out. And by the way, there are some scriptural principles to guide in this. You say, Pastor, Christian socialism? Yeah, the socialism actually can only work with Christians. I'm not saying we should be socialists because I don't know if it, there aren't nations that are saved. People are saved individually. But you remember what happened in the early church in Jerusalem? Everybody, every, there, was a, there was a dearth, there was great need, and everybody came and everybody gave and allowed the apostles the responsibility later, the deacons, the responsibility of distributing to people as they had need. And so this is really important. The Bible says that we are to, uh, that we are to take care of the necessity or distribute to the necessity of saints. It's too bad, isn't it? It's too bad, isn't it, that believers don't think first about getting help from believers? And the reason for that is because of a lack of a living sacrifice. In other words, if my brother or my sister has a need, then God is going to use me to fulfill it. Well, that's the way a living sacrifice is. This is what I live for. I don't live, I don't live for me. I live for God. And to live for God is to distribute to the necessity of the saints. And then the Bible says given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. You know, a good host or good hostess uh, and, and, and this is, of course, our last statement, so, so stay with me for just a second. A good host or a good hostess is not good because of saying the right words or performing the right action. A good host or good hostess is a good servant. So it could shake down different ways. If you're talking about hosting somebody in your home, it's making your home their place and making it so that it is, it is a more hospitable environment for them than it is for you. Given to hospitality. As believers, this is a biblical requirement for being a living sacrifice. This would be a good time to ask if anyone would be willing to house uh, six girls, or if a couple people would be willing to house six girls in June. I need two volunteers uh, in our church. Three girls and three girls, two, two houses to, to volunteer. And I'm going to ask every one of you while you exit today, if you would, <laughs> just joking. Uh, but the reality of it is, people that are given to hospitality would be vying for the opportunity to serve. And it isn't having people in your home necessarily; it's just hospitality. How are we as a church? It's easy to ask yourself the question: Do you notice visitors? Do you notice visitors? Do you know who they are? Have you found out if there's anything they need? Have you made it easy for them to visit? I don't want to talk about this just for a minute because it's a good opportunity to talk to our church about something like this. Everything doesn't have to be detailed, spelled out, and systematized and assigned in order for us to be a hospitable church, right? I don't have to have a guy that stands on the sidewalk and helps people know where to park. I don't have to have a designated person to open a door or to tell somebody what the hymn is or help them find a text in their Bible or find out what their name is or find out if they need anything, if they got an Uber ride here, if they could use a ride home, if whatever. Hospitality is just one of those things that just tries to serve people. Can you imagine how nice it would be? I'm not talking about overbearing, overwhelming. Some churches have the, what's the first thing that we're supposed to be? They have the dissimulation hospitality. 
anything I can do for you? And you just think, yeah, by the way, I need... I could tell a story about hospitality that affected me, but I don't have time to illustrate it today. But it was right before we started our church, and it was a real help to me to understand hospitality. It was a con contrast between two churches. We were actually driving our motor home. We were going to live in it. Driving our motor home to South Florida and uh, before we started our church, and, and I blew an engine. And I was, you know, in no man's land. And so it was Saturday night, so I got to a safe place, and I went to church. And the church I went to said... I actually went to it in an evening service. I'd gone somewhere else for the morning service. The church I went to asked, I met a guy, and he said, what are you doing here? Now, he wasn't being nosy. He was like, hey, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm not here by choice. I broke down outside of town, so I, I'm going to fix my motor home. Oh, you are. Somebody else said, what are you doing here? Uh, I went home that night after church, and it's funny because I didn't, tell, I didn't volunteer any information. I never do when I go to a church. I try to slip into the back row and slip out unnoticed. And uh, I went home to the place. We were at an a, a empty Texaco station where I'd have permission to park my motorhome and work on it. And I went back there that night, and there was a car sitting by my motorhome with the lights on. It was an elderly couple. And they said, we didn't get a chance to meet you in church, but we heard you were broken down. We have an apartment in our house, and we'd like you to come stay with us while you're fixing your motorhome. Never knew them. They didn't know me. And then... <laughs> And I tried to argue with them. They said, no, don't argue with this. It's stupid to, you know, I didn't say stupid, but it doesn't make any sense to try to live in a motorhome while you're working on it, blah, blah, blah. And so they took us to dinner and took us home. And we stayed with them. We're just a wonderful elderly couple. They're, they're good friends still today. The next morning I was working, and I'm telling you, everybody in that church came by. I was trying to work on taking an engine out. A guy came, you need an engine hoist? Uh, it's, you know, guy, I have an awning. I have a tent. I have whatever. And I'm telling you, these people in this church literally were so hospitable. Now, I evidently, they need to shake the church a little bit and put some of those people in other churches, I think. We, we left there. I had not diagnosed that I had a problem with my oil cooler on my motorhome, which had caused the issue to begin with. We left there, made it 40 miles, and blew the second engine. 40 miles from there. And <laughs> it was a Saturday night. It had been a week, taking me a week to fix my rebuild my engine in my motorhome. Saturday night, the next Sunday morning, I went to a church that was doctrinally would have been just like this one. And they had great music, and it was just a really well-done service and so forth. Nobody said a word to me. Nobody asked anything. And uh, I needed a place. I couldn't find anywhere in town to work on my motorhome, so I asked if I could work on it there at the church. They gave me permission to do that, which was generous of them, very kind of them. I don't have a criticism of the second church, by the way. But I needed the engine hoist again, so I called the guy in the first church who was 40 miles away. He said, I'll have it there. No, no, no. You know, the people from the first church came over to visit me. I got a phone call from another church in town than the one I'd gone to. And the guy said, yeah, Pastor so-and-so called me. And he said, you're broken down in town. And so on and so forth. And they tried to put me up in a hotel. Tried to do all. We didn't need all that. But I just want to tell you something. It warmed my heart and it really helped show me something about hospitality. And the idea of hospitality isn't, you know, come stay at my house. It's making life better for you than it is for me. And we as believers, and again, this is a behavior that's toward each other. We ought to be hospitable toward each other. We ought to say, you know what, I wonder. We ought to look at people and wonder if they're comfortable. Wonder if everything's okay. Wonder if, and I'm not talking about, you know, overanalyzing things, but I'm just talking about recognize people's needs and meet them very graciously. Hospital. Distributing the necessity of the saints. Hospital. Give people what they need and be hospitable about it. Hospitable about it. Okay, that's, these are helps, aren't they? So the question I asked this morning at the beginning of the message, and we haven't answered all the question, but the question I asked this morning at the beginning of the message was living sacrifice. What is it? Well, living sacrifice is a believer who knows his spiritual gift and acts toward other believers the way that we've described in this morning's message. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice in addition to everything else in the end of Romans. So we thank the Lord for what we've learned this morning? Mm. Father, thank you for opening our eyes and opening our minds and teaching us truth. And God, living out our faith is very practical. This is not where you give us a nebulous statement like, die to self, but this is actually an instance where in the scripture you say die to self and here's how to do it. 
Lord, I pray that you would give us appropriate conviction. And then, Father, along with the conviction, an excitement, a fervency in realizing I can do this. I can be a living sacrifice. Before I finish my prayer this morning, I believe everyone here today is saved. And so I want to ask a couple of questions this morning that have to do with the message or with the passage of Scripture. Before we begin our invitation, I'd just like to ask a practical question. And the question would be this. Would it be true that you and I would have to acknowledge today that many of the concepts of being a living sacrifice are not what God's Word details practically that it actually is? In other words, what I thought being a living sacrifice is and what it actually is is something that my eyes have been opened to today. If that's you uh, this morning, you'd say, you know what, I've, I've had my eyes open to, being, to what being a living sacrifice is. We just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, God showed me some things. Okay, just slip them up, slip them right back down. God showed me some things about being a living sacrifice that I did not know. Okay? If God has done that for you, if God showed you that, then, then the invitation this morning is very simple. It's not, I think, probably a come forward invitation or go back invitation as it is in our church. But it is one of those invitations where you ought to respond to God two ways. The first way is to say, thank you, God, for showing me truth. Isn't it wonderful to have God's Word teach you things that maybe you didn't know? So to thank God. Thank you, God, for teaching me. And the second part is, yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will live what I've learned. All right. If you're physically able to do so, in just a moment, after we finish our prayer, we're going to stand to our feet. We are going to have a hymn of invitation. And our invitation song this morning will be simply uh, page 242. And we're going to finish our prayer, and we'll begin to sing this morning. Father, thank you so much for what we've learned today, and I ask you to bless and move in the invitation. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're physically able to stand, page 242, this morning, Jesus, I come. And uh, as we sing, Jesus, I come, just do business with the Lord in your heart. Say, thank you, Lord, for showing me truth. And yes, Lord, I will apply what you've showed me. Jesus, I come. Page 242.